All right, class, so today we continue our lesson in Unit 4, and we are learning about the empires of Asia. And specifically, we are in uh, Chapter 8, Dynasties of China, and uh, we are doing Section 2, the Mongol Empire. And today, we will learn about uh, life in Yuan, China. So recently in lesson 2.1, we learn about the life of Genghis Khan or Chenghis Khan. And today uh, we will learn about their rule in China. Now you have to understand that the Mongols are nomadic herders um, and generally not considered as Chinese, but they were able to mobilize themselves into a fighting machine uh, that were able to conquer most parts of Central Asia and a greater part uh, of Europe. And uh, of course, uh, in the process, they were able to take over or conquer and take charge over the mighty and powerful um, China during this time. So in the previous lesson, we learned about the guy who united these nomadic herders and his name is Chenghis Khan. And today we will continue the rule of his grandson, uh, Kublai Khan, and uh, the empire that he built called the Yuan Dynasty uh, during this time. So go ahead, have your books ready, or go to our website at Loda USD website, and from there launch Clever. And as you launch Clever, go ahead, log into Cengage Learning, which is the National Geographic Learning our world history book. And from the left side, navigate from unit four to chapter eight, to section two, to lesson two, life in Yuan. And specifically, it's in pages 222 to 223. This chapter's essential question is what legacy did China leave to the modern world? And the objective of this lesson is to identify how the Mongols ruled China. The Yuan Dynasty introduced the International Postal Service to China and eventually the world, as well as an accurate 365 day calendar, which is basically the same as what we are using today. So this lesson explains this and other innovations that developed under the Yuan rule. Well, to start with, uh, the Mongol Empire is known for its destructive approach to, you know, expanding their empire. And pretty much uh, during the reign of Chenghis Khan or Genghis Khan, actually, it's really more on just destroying on their paths. So Kublai Khan adopted a less destructive approach to government uh, than his predecessors. So trying to win over Chinese people and uh, preserve conquered towns instead of destroying them. Um, even so, he, he you know, basically brutally punished every form of resistance in order to keep the crowd in control. So during 1270s, Song loyalists continued to fight the Mongols in southern China. The Mongols defeated the Song uprising of 200,000 troops and then killed an entire population of Hang Zhou city. To avoid further suffering, remaining officials of the Song Dynasty surrendered in 1279. Now this is important. Kublai Khan was now ruler of all China, the first to unite all China since the end of the Tang Dynasty, which ended in 1907. Um, what's uh, significant about this is he is the first foreign ruler ever. He would rule for 15 years until his death in 1294. His Yuan dynasty led China for a century, but it was not an easy time for the Chinese because uh, basically they are very harsh to the Chinese people. And there are, of course, obviously a lot of resistance because the Chinese people see the Mongols, obviously, as invaders they are not chinese people real chinese people and because of this of course um the treatment to them by the mongols is was harsh so that's the situation that they had for 100 years 
First and foremost, the Mongols were nomadic herders slash warriors. So they are not used to governing and controlling. They are more familiar with fighting, uh, especially for a country as large and sophisticated as China. It demanded a highly organized government or bureaucracy. Under the Yuan dynasty, Chinese government continued as much as before with strong central state built around a bureaucratic system with Confucian rituals and ceremonies. If you can still remember, you know, Confucianism, it is one of the major philosophies slash religion in China with Taoism and Buddhism. Now, the main difference uh, was that the Mongols excluded Chinese people from higher positions uh, to stop them from having too much power. So instead, Mongols and foreigners, especially Muslims, received the top jobs. So foreigners migrated to China, including the famous Italian merchant Marco Polo, probably are familiar with this guy, it's in the key vocab, who served as a tax collector and a special envoy to the emperor. However, the Chinese scholars still had a strong unofficial influence and Kublai Khan relied on Chinese advisors. So this is the system uh, that was in the Yuan uh, government system in China. So foreigners are the head of this uh, mighty empire and uh, the second class citizens are its original Chinese citizens, which we will discuss about in the social classes next. Now let's talk about social classes because this is an important aspect or area of any civilization, understanding how their society is structured. So under the Yuan uh, dynasty, most Chinese hated living under the Mongols who treated them as second class citizens in their own country. During their reign, the society was divided into four classes. At the top, obviously, are the Mongols, followed by the non-Chinese foreigners, which is very interesting because they are considered more important than the locals. Uh, then came the northern Chinese, who lived longest under the Yuan rule. And at the very bottom of the society were the southern Chinese, who made up about 80% of the population. In other words, they are the masses. Just like the feudal system in Europe, many peasants are obviously at the bottom of the social pyramid or structure. And when they are unable to pay their taxes, they are forced to um, abandon their lands. And because of this, they are unable to feed their own families. Many sold themselves into slavery far from home. And these are like indebted slaves. The government forced peasants as well to work on extravagant imperial projects. For example, the Yuan dynasty rebuilt Beijing as a wealthy city filled with magnificent palaces and pleasure gardens enjoyed by rich foreigners. Of course, these um, projects, all of this luxury came at a cost for the Chinese. So the Mongols feared rebellion because of the pressures they placed on the Chinese. Looking for signs of revolt, agents working for the government kept a close eye on neighborhoods. They are like spies and snitches. And they forced every 10 Chinese families to share a single knife. The government banned meetings and fairs and prevented the Chinese from going out at night or playing sports, thinking it was too much like military exercise. So the Yuan dynasty make a significant contribution though. So during its reign, uh, trade and agriculture expanded. For example, they built roads and extended the Grand Canal that was uh, originally a Sui dynasty project. So the Mongol Postal Service provided efficient communication and the government introduced an accurate calendar of 365.2 days. Also with many Chinese scholars out of work, they had more time to write, and Chinese literature flourished. So still, the Chinese remained hostile to Mongol rule and formed secret societies to, to plot rebellions. So after Kublai Khan's death in 1294, the Yuan dynasty gradually declined. There were seven emperors in 40 years, none of them as gifted as Kublai Khan, 
and rebellion started to break out. And by 1368, China was poised to yet another change in dynasties. Now let's take a look at this picture uh, that was mentioned of uh, the many projects that was um, continued by the Yuan dynasty, for example, the Grand Canal. As you can see here, people in China still use the Grand Canal, shown in this uh, photo, uh, to move their products, their goods up and down the river. And today it is still being utilized by many Chinese merchants. So this is not uh, an original project of the Yuan Dynasty. It is from the Sui Dynasty, if you can still remember, and they just expanded it uh, to make some improvements and some repairs. Now let's take a look at the review and assess questions. For number one reading check, how did the Mongols treat the Chinese under their rule? And number two, make inferences. Why did Kublai Khan exclude the Chinese from important jobs in the government? When we say important jobs, these are like the jobs that has more power and authority over others. And number three, analyze cause and effect. Under the Yuan dynasty, how did the Mongols open China to foreigners? So those are the review and assess questions. Now go ahead, go to our Google Classroom and open the review and assess assignment, section two from chapter eight. And it is the lesson that we just covered. We just discussed life in Yuan, China, and answer the following questions. But before you do that, don't forget to fill up the basic information about your name, class period, and date. And our key vocab is a person, Marco Polo. And don't forget the title of the lesson and the correct answers to the questions that I just uh, read. And if you want to get the full credit, obviously you need to write incomplete sentences and using your own words. So that is our lesson for today, Chapter 8, Section 2.2, Life in Yuan, China.